All right. Well, we're still looking at the book of Hebrews. If you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles to chapter 3, verse 7, we're going to start there. Uh, missed last Sunday. I wasn't in town, so I feel like I've lost myself. It was uh, kind of exciting to get back and start looking at this lesson and looking at it last week, even though I didn't teach on it. But I tell you what, this is really an exciting book, and it should be very exciting to you as a Christian because of the fact that even though he's looking at Hebrews, who he's trying to exhort these Hebrews who had become Christians, Ooh. that he was trying to exhort them to become Christians, that, and they had become Christians, but then all of a sudden they're starting to wafer, they're trying to waffle back a little bit because of some persecution and issues like that. And that, that is something that is parallel to us as Christians today as well, regardless of whether you come from a Hebrew background or not. The fact that there are times and trials in our lives that can cause us to start to pull back a little bit from him. So what I love is the way that he starts out this book. Immediately, he starts out right away and says, you know, that God spoke to us. That's important. But in the past, this is how he used to preach and teach to us. It was through prophets. It was through the law. It was through these other methods. But he says now there's a new way. He now speaks to you and I through Jesus. Now, again, I want you to think about this from the point of view of somebody who lived in that century. And as far as they knew, there was this man named Jesus. And I want you to pick up on that, that he's already done this a couple of times where he says Jesus. He doesn't say the Messiah. He doesn't say the Christ. He's talking about the man. He's trying to reinforce the idea that to the Jew, that this was the man that the council rejected, that put him before Pontius Pilate, and that the Romans crucified. That man. That's the man. And you accepted him at some point, and you became a Christian. But he's still a person. And he uses that on purpose and then links him. But he starts out and says, the superiority, basically, of who? Of Jesus. That he's greater than all of them. And so he's got to bring them through there. And he shows and starts out that great superiority. And he talks about angels. Apparently there was some issue with angel worship and, and showing some reverence towards angels and heavenly bodies and so he addresses that idea that he's even greater to them and he brings out scripture and points out that to which angel did the lord ever talk and promise these things to him who and then points out the fact that what are their jobs <laughs> what's an angel's job no then then when he goes and he gives then he shifts in these back and forth kind of encouragements and then warns about drifting and how that drifting is something that could happen to them if they were discouraged or a little fatigued or tired or something going on in their lives, if slowly they just kind of move away. They lose a little bit of zeal. They stop really wanting to hang out, and they just start drifting away. See this all the time with people? Sometimes maybe it's just a spiritual moment that, they, that happens, but sometimes it manifests outwardly and people stop coming to church. And I know of very few Christians or any that's ever confessed this, but ever said that, you know, they had this epiphany one morning where they woke up and went, I'm not a Christian anymore, I'm not going to church. That it was actually a slow process. So he warns them, because you have this great, superior man, Jesus, that God has now appointed as somebody to speak for us, and he's so great, be careful. Be careful, don't drift away. Pull back, come back over here. And then the next, in 3, verses 1 through 6, he talks about this confidence. But the way he does it is what is so fascinating. And that's the link that we're going to have in tonight's class. But the verse 6 here is when he says, what confidence do we have? Something that we can all share in that they should be encouraged at is this house. You go, well, you know, it's a house. What's a house? We, that's one of the things I went over was when he talks about God's house, what is God's house? Well, under the Mosaic law, it was the Mosaic house. It was the house of Abraham, the Hebrews, and it was all the things wrapped up into that, into that land, physical promise. But the new house is what he now is starting to show, and they're aware of it because they've been taught. These, these are now Christians. You have now come into this new house, and this is the house of God. And in that is where he's going to talk about and link this rest because he talks about who built this house and comparing it to Moses. You remember he talks about he's gone through angels, he went through Moses, 
talking about the superiority to it and the, the, the beauty and wisdom of the way that he weaves that in without just being blatantly, Moses isn't no good, Jesus is better. You know, he brings up the logical conclusion you must come up with that if the person who built that house is Jesus is much greater than the guy who lived in the house. Right? Oh, okay, the scripture, he points to it and says, look, that man, Jesus, yeah, he, he's the builder. Moses, great guy, man. That, that man was a great prophet, did wonderful things, and, and was fulfilling the promises of God. But there was something very different about him. And that's about that house. One built it. The other one was a servant in it. And the other one, Jesus, was the son, not a servant in a relationship inside that house. So with that knowledge, it should be encouraging that you are partakers in that. And, but now it's like the Hebrew writer almost goes, you can still fail. You, see, you know, even though you have that encouragement, you know that, be aware. You can be inside the house, but you know what? You can end up leaving it. You can fall away from it. And remember, I pointed out the idea that the way he says about therefore uses that. So now let's read the text, and then we're going to come back and parse it out a little bit, starting in verse 7 and then through 19. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day in the rebellion, on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses? With whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So let's bring that back now. So he just talked about this great house. And he says, now therefore... And he's going to then encourage them and bring up this idea of this rest, your goal, your achievement, your, your blessings that you're going to gain. And why? Because you're a part of this house. And so because of that, he says, remember, what did he say? So he says, therefore, let's get this rest. Why? Because Jesus is superior. In what? Well, in his office. He was both priest and prophet. Was Moses? No. Couldn't be priest and prophet. Which, by the way, put a little note there. Because the Jews sitting there going, whoa, genealogy check. Fact check that. <laughs> priest? How could he do that? So just hold on to that because I know the Jews sitting there going, I get it. You can call him a prophet, but you just called him both. So the Hebrew writer's got to deal with that. But he's telling him he was both. In that, and that's the text before that. So he's superior in office. He is superior in his work. What did he accomplish? He built the house of God. Now, Jesus is eternal. Remember what John said that from the beginning. He was with God and he was God. And that nothing came into existence without Jesus. Basically, he's pointing out that the part of the Godhead, this Jesus, was doing the creation. He was involved in the house of God under Moses and under the Mosaic law. So he was the builder of the house. 
He also is superior in his person. Because he's a son, he's not a servant. And because of that, we are his house. And so now, if we are his house, let's go further and punch this in and say, don't blow it. Don't blow it. So that's why he says, therefore. Now this idea, when this, you know, who's doing the same? Who, who's, who's talking here? When you look at that, he doesn't say Jesus said. He doesn't say Moses said. He says the Spirit said. And then now you say, well, that's, isn't it all the same? Mm. How does God speak to us? What did he establish at the beginning? He established that now he speaks through Jesus. So what about the Spirit? Well, now we have to go back over to John when Jesus had told his disciples that he would send them a helper and that would be the Holy Spirit. And that the Spirit would know exactly what Jesus wanted to articulate and to speak and communicate. So when he says the Spirit, guess what he just did? He just took that man, Jesus, who he established in the very first verses as God's spokesman, and he's using the Spirit to speak. So if you're a Jew and you're sitting there going, whoa, you're talking about this man that was executed. We accepted him as Messiah. We're trying to pull back a little bit. He's greater than Moses. He built the house. He's an apostle and a priest. We are in this house. And the Spirit speak. Wait a minute. Didn't he say Jesus speak? Oh, the Spirit. So now you've taken this name, Jesus, a notch higher. You're showing that the Spirit is working for who? Now, the other part about this is so awesome. Look what he says. The Spirit says. Now, when you go and look at the Greek word, past tense, orus, and all that stuff like that, you know, we can say that sometimes. We'll use words like, um, you know, Ron said. And if I said that, what would you say? You'd say, well, well, that's in the past. So this is indicating current, active, still saying it. He's not just saying, oh, I'm going to throw, the Spirit's going to quote some some message. No! The Spirit is telling you this. So who's doing it? Jesus is telling you and I this same message, the same message that the builder of that house was speaking to those in the house of Moses when they came out of Egypt. And it's not in a dead past tense. It's still something very active. So it's important. We know this historical moment. Now, you notice Psalms 95? I thought that was amazing. But basically, this is exactly where he's quoting all of this from, is Psalm 95. Now, what I think is interesting about Psalm 95 is that Psalm 95, and let's go back over there, I think it's very interesting because when you look at Psalm 95, in mine, it's titled, Let Us Sing Songs of Praise. And if you're looking for a scripture to read, you go, oh, here's one we'll read out loud. It's, it's great. It's perfect for worship. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into the presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and the king above all God. In the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains and the sea is his. He made it. His hands formed. And he goes on this glorious things, right? And then he says, come, let us worship and bow down before the maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And then all of a sudden, the psalmist goes, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Whoa, where'd that come from? We were doing fantastic, weren't we? Weren't we doing a wonderful job about talking about the glory of God and giving praise to God? And all of a sudden, the psalm writer goes, Whoa! Don't harden your heart. And he takes them back to the exact historical event that occurred. So there's two parts. You have this wonderful moment that the psalmist is invoking about worship and love and glory of God. And then all of a sudden it's like big downer. <laughs> don't, don't, don't get hard hearted. And so it's interesting Psalm 95, and this is what the Hebrew writer is listening to and referring to. So, the Hebrew listener, 
is extremely familiar with two aspects. One, he's familiar with it because it's a historical event that he grew up as a little bitty, bitty, bitty baby growing up and learned about. That great rebellion. The second thing is, they knew the Psalms. Man, <laughs> you know, if one thing the kids got out of it is they were extremely inundated with the Psalms. So when they heard these words and phrases, they may not be able to go to, and I'm just using this loosely because they didn't have book, chapter, and verse, but they may not be able to go, oh, I know what book Psalm that is. But man, they knew that Psalm. They knew those words. So if you're a Jew and you just listen to him say that, they will remember, hey, you know, if you're reading that and all of a sudden the Hebrew writer goes, don't harden your hearts and goes through all that, you know what? It's kind of like a song that you know so well and all of a sudden all they do is give you the chorus. What do you do? You'll sit and think about, well, what about, what about the first line? Oh, that song also says this and this and this. You see what he did? The Holy Spirit grabbed the bottom half of that, brings it over to the Hebrew readers, but they're so well knowledgeable of the Psalms that the first part of that Psalm is going to be something that's just going to crawl and go, the glory of God, the wonderful mercies, the magnificence of the Father. Don't forget it. What did he just do? in this chapter, this book. He just went through, and he's gone through and said, look at this wonderful, look at the glory of God displayed in His Son and how superior His God is over the angels and to what angel has He ever said these great things to. And look at Him compared to Aaron, I mean to Moses, and the house, He's the builder of the house. It's almost the first part of Psalm 95. The first part of these chapters. You kind of look at the essence of that. And it's amazing. So if you're a Hebrew, it's starting to pull it together. And they can relate to this historical event because it's such an embarrassment, right? I mean, it's so horrible. So what did he say when they rebelled? And I thought also another part of this is the day of testing in the wilderness. They tested God. How do you test God? How do you test him? And, it, and it God testable? And I mean, it's kind of... So, in other ways, it looks at as provoking. They're provoking. Isn't that a frightening thought that you and your actions could be provoking God? Who wants to provoke God? Anybody want to pick on God? Uh-uh. That's like that biggest kid in school that was the meanest, biggest kid in school who had the guts, except the silly kid that had no sense, would want to go provoke the biggest bully? Don't want to do it, because you know. And what's interesting is he's saying that's what they were doing in all the conflict and the complaining and griping as they went out from Egypt. And they saw his works, as the psalmist said, for 40 years, even after, even after they failed to go into the land of promise. You'd think they'd say, hey guys, we've got to clean up our act, man. If we want to make it into the promised land, we've got to pull it together here. No! Instead of getting closer to God and accepting their punishment and understanding we deserve it, they kept complaining, kept provoking him. Okay, so you provoked him to the point where he did not let you come in to the land of promise. And then that whole 40 years, you're still provoking him, and then they'll make it. So how does that apply to us? Well, that's what the Hebrew writer is saying. You have come and become a part of God's house, and you should have confidence in that. But understand that you as well, just like what happened to all those people, they were provoking God because of this condition of their heart. And not a one of them, I don't think, went around and saw their neighbor and went, hey, hey, would you... Quit provoking God. Or saying, whoa, that was a provo provocation of God. But they were doing it. Why? Because they're disbelief. They weren't faithful. They weren't acknowledging and acknowledging Him. And so because of that, they saw His works, and yet they still rejected Him. What have you seen as a Christian? Are you grasping for something? 
well, then maybe that's the problem, right? Maybe that's the problem. I mean, if you can't see what God's doing for you and been blessed by Him, then don't you think that's a little bit of a provocation? That if you can't acknowledge what God has done for you in his, your life, just like the children of Israel, they were being fed every day, miraculously from the skies. Their clothes never wore out. And they never saw it. And if you would have asked them, so what did God do for you? Led us in the wilderness? Well, what about the daily food you're receiving all the time? Oh, that manna stuff. Oh, yeah, I guess so. What about your clothes that never wear out? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I guess so. I guess there are a few more things. You see how they're not any different than us? If you're grasping to be able to identify what God is doing for you, then you just might be provoking Him as well. And that's because of a condition, he goes on to say. There's an issue going on. You think they would, if you went up and said, you're going to die in the wilderness because you keep provoking God. Oh, I'm not doing that. That's the problem, you see, and that's what we do to God all the time. We think we're serving Him good. We think we're doing a great job, and He's sitting there going, you are provoking me. <laughs> you know, you have no faith. You're not loving me. You're not doing what I want. And how long do you think you can provoke Him? So therefore, because they provoked God, he said, I was disgusted with that generation. I gave them up. And why? They always go astray. Where? In their hearts. Now the heart is the seed of emotion. The psalmist and Proverbs link that to an idea that you've got to be careful by following your heart. Because your heart can lead you astray. It's not within a man in himself to guide himself. It has to be God's word that gives us that correct path. So it started in their hearts. The pleasures of the world. The immediate gratification or the immediate suffering. That that's all they could get. They couldn't get past the idea that, okay, today's going to be hot. It's not God's fault. You know, many of the things that go on around us today, instead of looking at the blessings, we start to, to look at that. And so slowly, and he says, they have not known my ways. When did they not know his ways? I mean, weren't they at the mountain when they read it? When they read the law? Weren't they the same ones that were chanting, you know, when Moses said, choose today life or death? And he gives them that great list. And they all go, you bet, man, we're there. Did they not know him? Well, that's the problem with the heart that starts to become callous with self-willed desires. It becomes hard. And it loses the knowledge of God. Remember those blessings and those curses that he, he promised to give to them if they did. And so he swore in his wrath and they did not enter. So now, just like to these Hebrew writers, be careful. Be careful. Don't repeat that history. And he says, the way he describes this is you in an evil, unbelieving heart. A heart that does not believe. But they at one point did believe. They didn't start ignorant, stay ignorant, and still ignorant. They started out maybe ignorant, but God expressed to them what He had required of them, and they joined into that covenant. You as a Christian, before you became a Christian, Maybe you had been a little bit ignorant about a lot of the things about that relationship you're going to have with Him. But once you become a Christian, you as well have an obligation in that. And so, our unbelief is because we stop expressing it. We stop doing it. We stop acting upon it. And so, it leads you away. And they fall away from God. So what's the solution? Exhort. One another. Every day. As long as it's called today. So when is today? Tomorrow? No. Yesterday? No. When's today? Right now. So if we were here tomorrow, wouldn't it be today? So in other words, don't exhort tomorrow. Don't exhort in the past. Do it now. 
while you're alive, while you're in this active present tense of existence. Don't put it off for tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow I'll exhort somebody. Tomorrow I'll give somebody a call and encourage them. That's what Satan wants you to do. Oh, I'll I'll encourage somebody tomorrow. I'll exhort them. We need the exhortation of one another to help prevent us failing to enter that rest. And how can we do it if we don't see one another? If we're not coming together? You see why later on in this very same book the Hebrew writer is going to talk about don't forsake coming together with the saints. Why? Ties in with this. How do we prevent ourselves from developing this hard heart? It's by helping one another, encouraging one another. Today is the only day you have right now. There's also something interesting that I thought was fascinating is talking about the 40 years, talking about this very historical moment and that they spent 40 years and they all died. And there was an end to that and the new generation then was able to go into this new uh, land of milk and honey. Remember that? 40 years. I read, and now this is just, this is just me, okay? But it just dawned on me this last week. I picked up on something and I completely can be wrong. But I know God is not completely silly about some of his numbers and his uh, symbolism and things. God uses those very purposefully. Numbers mean certain things. You know, seven is the perfect number. He uses those numbers to mean something. And it, and it dawned on me because I, in reading this, one person was talking about how that they were warned to take care of it while they have time because there is a point where they would not be able to. That they were going to reach a point. Just like with the children who were wandering, they would reach a point where it's done. There's no more. There's something coming at the end of this. And I started looking at the destruction of Jerusalem. It occurred at 70 A.D. Now, if you go back and you count when Jesus was crucified, they count that as 33 A.D. If you start with when his ministry began, it would be 30 A.D. that he came and he was offering them this full reconciliation with God the Father and to bring them the peace that they would have with the Father, that they would start to be able to come and gather this rest. And this may be, and again, I'm not that smart in this, but I just think that there's something also here, I think, that is interesting that 40 years go by and the destruction of the temple is done. And any Hebrew who's read this, that wanted to go back, it's gone. 40 years. 40 years he talks about here in the wilderness. They're wandering. And then they all die and it's done. And you're talking about how great of Aaron and all the mosaic things. And then all of a sudden at 70 A.D., after 40 years, total destruction. Never able to have that temple again. I don't know. I like to discuss it, but I just thought that was something I'd come up with. Why is this important? Because we share in Christ. Notice now he doesn't say Jesus. Now he's saying the Christ. But you know who he is by now. He's Connected enough dots that now you should be able to come in there with that. But look again. Here's this idea of confidence. Remember the confidence of the house? And here again, he talks about this. If we indeed hold our original confidence firm to the end. We have to have this confidence, which is really closely associated to faith. Belief. And he comes back and repeats the same type of a warning when he says... As it is said. So it was spoken to them in the past, and he's repeating it again. Today, not tomorrow, not yesterday. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. If you harden your heart, you have an evil heart, and it's a rebellious heart. And then I love the way he concludes this section, and we'll start chapter 4 next week. 
And he does it brilliantly by bringing out the logical conclusion. It's, it's, it's almost a rhetorical question, he says. Look what he says. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses? The very people who saw all the miracles and were led out. They're the ones that yet rebelled. And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not? He kind of keeps building it up. Not only the, the same ones that they led out from Egypt, but they're also the ones who sinned. And then he goes to the next. And he, what happened? Their bodies fell in the wilderness. And to whom did he swear would not enter their rest, but to those who were disobedient? The same group of people. You want to be that? You want to fall into that category of the same group of people as Christians to fall away like that? So he says, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. That's the warning he has for us. Even today, you know, whether you're a Jew reading this letter initially, is that we as well, no matter how secure we feel our salvation is, we can start to develop a hard heart. A hard heart is something that cannot absorb nutrients. You know, when you look at the real fleshly heart, we look at that, it's unable to have that belief. It becomes slow, like he said about the drifting. And I want you to look within your own heart and think about the way you've been living before God. And hopefully you will desire that rest because of the confidence that you have in the fact that as a Christian, we are part of a very great house that was built by the greatest one of all. And that is Jesus Christ, the Lord and our Savior. So if we can help you at all in your relationship with him, I hope that you'll take this time, think about it, and look forward to next week looking at the chapter 4 and looking at the rest of this part of idea of entering the rest. And if you'd like to and you're comfortable, let us know while we stand and sing the invitation song. Why keep Jesus waiting, waiting in the cold? He will bear you gently, gently to his fold. Say him soul and open, I implore. Why keep Jesus waiting? Waiting at the door, oft he knocketh softly, softly o'er and o'er. Hear him, soul, and open, I implore. Why keep Jesus pleading? Pleading at the door, <clears throat> he would be your savior ever, evermore. Love him, soul, and